Well, we just want to thank everyone who is, has joined us this evening. And I just want to go over a little housekeeping on um, how our Zooms work if you have not uh, joined us before. So if you sent questions in advance to the Chief's chat email, uh, we'll go ahead and, and we'll respond to those. If you're joining us in Zoom, uh, go ahead and put any questions you have in the chat box and we will uh, respond to those. And we wanna thank and say hello to all of our folks joining us on Facebook. And we will also uh, capture questions that you're posting there and we'll get it to our panel to answer your questions. We have captioning uh, this evening and we have Spanish translation as well. And so I'm going to hand it off to Lupe to say hello to her audience. Buenas tardes. Yo voy a dar, voy a traducir el chateo con el jefe de esta noche. Por favor, dale la bienvenida a nuestra anfitriona, Megan Berger. Ella es una EMT, agente de recuperación de fugitivos, sobreviviente de trata de personas y educadora que ha vivido en el condado de Sonoma por cuatro años. Si usted tiene una pregunta, por favor, use la función de chat y con gusto le contestamos las preguntas. Gracias. And now I'll turn it over to Megan Berger. Welcome. Hi, thank you guys for having me. And uh, it's good to see you again, Chief Matos. Um, you know, last month we worked together and, um, you know, I don't I don't know if it's something that you, you put out there, but the, you know, the public, I'll go ahead and say it. Last month you had me in working with your department for 10 hours and, uh, and doing training on human trafficking, right? Uh, risks, red flags. We did the trauma formed uh, victim response. And I just want to say, Thank you so much because your department did amazing. Uh, the officers were engaged, asking questions, really eager to learn uh, how to work with victims and improve uh, the current model, right? And um, totally awesome. So I'm glad to, to see you again. Thank you, Megan. Um, you know, it's funny, I know uh, early on in these chats, you had reached out and said, hey, how, how, how does someone become a host? So that's kind of one of the ways we got connected. Um, and then when we talked, we, you told me about your background. And so one of the things that we've done here at the department, we had some, some, some meetings. Um, and one of the things we discussed in those meetings was training. And one of the things the officer said was we want purposeful training. We want meaningful training, right? And that's when I reached out to you and said, hey, what, what do you think? Would you like to come? And you were so gracious to come to five-hour sessions. Um, and it's not always easy walking into a, you know, a law enforcement agency and going into a room full of law enforcement officers and, and, and providing five hours of training to it. But you did an amazing job and I know they appreciated it. And that's really the kind of training we wanna do here, right? We wanna real live training that means something and helps our officers out on the street. So uh, thank you for bringing that up and thank you for, uh, for doing that training for our department. Yeah, absolutely, anytime. So we are gonna start with email questions for you. And I have, I've got a few here. So my first question was, why does Runner Park have police that are cross-trained as firefighters and vice versa? Seeing with all the needed refresher training required, officers would be less competent in either job than if they focused on one job. That's a fair question. I think it's, uh, I think it's the, uh, what the jack of all trades and master of none, uh, maybe someone is, is looking at here. But, uh, you know, this is not, this is a unique, um, a unique model in California, but public safety is not a unique model nationwide. Um, there's a lot of public safety off, uh, offices in the Midwest and up in like the areas of Michigan and, and that area. So um, I think one of the things that, that gets it, it's not normal in California. We're really one of only real two public safety agencies here. So, um, but it is unique and it does take a lot of training. Um, and we have a really robust training program here. Uh, we have an overlap every Thursday. So half of the department is training every Thursday. And even if you're assigned a fire, you're still attending police trainings. And even if you're assigned to police, you're attending fire training. So you're getting refreshed all year long. Um, and we have a mandatory rotation. So you have to, you have to work both disciplines uh, every so many rotations. Um, but but you're right. It, it is a it's a it's a challenge to maintain that level of training. But I feel that because we do it 
and and we have we we are maintaining that that it does provide some additional services to the public. Um, for instance, everybody who's gone through the fire academy and received their certificates carry all their fire gear in their car, and they're assigned that car for the rotation. So when they're out patrolling and a fire breaks out, as I said before, the little black and white cars get there much quicker than that big red engine. And so you've got firefighters showing up on scene ahead of the engine, um, identifying locations of fire hydrants, uh, putting their gear on so they're adding to the firefight, uh, identifying hot spots uh, where the fire is, can we see flames? So they're already relaying this information to the engine that is coming, which normally doesn't happen until you get on scene. So, um, you know, it, it does help. They get additional training in, in, in first aid. So, you know, it, it, so you've got people who are a little higher trained with, uh, with medical knowledge. You also have paramedics and, e, and EMTs who are in the car sometimes. So uh, for, every, for every downfall you might see there with the training stuff, there's, a, there's definitely a benefit to the community. So, uh, but I think we do, it, we, do it, we do it right, we do it well. And, and I'm, proud that, I'm proud to be part of a public safety agency. It's been a big challenge for me to learn it, but uh, I understand it now. And, and I think it's really good for the community. All right. Um, this one's kind of good evening, Chief. I have three questions, so we'll start with one. I'm curious. I live in Runner Park and I've worked in Nevada for 35 years. Any idea when the bottleneck to two lanes after the Petaluma River Bridge is supposed to be fixed? Uh, no, um, I I actually travel that road quite often, also, and and. I'm hopeful that someday it will be fixed, but I, I don't know. I, I do know that that's a big project and it seems like every every year they promise it'll be widened this year. So I, I don't have that answer, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, hopefully it'll, uh, it'll end soon so you can, uh, you can have a smoother commute. My next question is in regards to moving unregistered vehicles off public streets. There's one near my home I've called about. The reg dates back to 2019 and I was told it's in process and it takes time. It does not run and the owner occasionally moves it. Sometimes it sits for two weeks in the same place. Sometimes he moves it eight feet up, then back. If people are able to leave unregistered cars on the street for months or years, why do we have laws stating otherwise? I think as soon as it's discovered unregistered, it should be towed away at the owner's expense. So a person after my own heart here, I'll tell you, um, you know, there, there are, you, you should have your cars registered to have them on the street. Uh, we agree with that. So part of what's happened is, is when COVID hit, there were a lot of a lot of emergency orders put in place by the governor's office um, because DMV offices were closed down, state offices were closed down, right? So people just couldn't get registrations, they couldn't get licenses, they couldn't get a lot of stuff, and so there were some temporary holds put on what law enforcement could do regarding uh, unlicensed drivers or or people ha who have you know, expired licenses, people who have expired registration. Those are starting to lift now uh, with co with us coming at least out of COVID a little bit. Um, but that's part of the problem. So when I say it's a process, it's, there, there's holds on it. We can't just go tow people's cars right now because of registration, because they may not have had the opportunity to get it registered because DMV. Um, but the person may also not, under, not know that this vehicle has received some citations. That's something they wouldn't know. Um, and if the vehicle is being moved, if they're playing the moving game, that makes it difficult for us too. Um, and the other thing we sometimes do is go after it as abandoned, especially if it's not running. But the minute we send a letter to the owner, which we're required to do and wait 10 days, if that person moves that vehicle, we have to start that process all over. So uh, don't not call in, please call in because um, if we can do something about it, we will. We have three CSOs who do uh, vehicle abatement throughout the city uh, full time. So, um, but yeah, that, that's, that's probably what you're more seeing as a result of COVID and how it fits and holds on what we can do in DMV right now. Okay, and the last question uh, was for me. It says, I hope you are doing well and wanted to thank you both for your services to the community. Uh, I'm sure she will likely discuss what a fusion agent, fusion, recovery agent does, but if it doesn't come up, can you elaborate on what it is? So a fugitive recovery agent, basically um, I get hired by a bail bondsman after they bail somebody out who does not show up to court. And then I would track that person down and then bring them into the jail 
and therefore closing out their bail bond. And you know, it's just something that we do. It, it's at zero dollars to the taxpayer. So you have somebody who skips bail. You know, the police may not have eight hours to go find this person. I have eight hours to go find this person, and I'm going to do that. That's that's basically a summary of what I do. I put people back in jail that don't show up for court and hold up their end of the bargain. <laughs> so, okay, next email. Can you give us an idea of how Chief Matos and our city council will interpret this data from July 4th and what other data they might use to make a decision about the firework vote? Um, yeah, so the, as everybody knows, you watched the council meeting, we did a review of, of 4th of July. I talked about calls for service, um, how many citations we issued, how many calls we responded to. Um, you know, we, of course, we always look at that data. We compare it year to year to see what's happening in our community. Are we getting more or less calls? But, you know, it's, I think it's important for the community to know that, that as far as fireworks, um, the future of fireworks in, in Rona Park, it, it's up to the community now. Um, the public safety department and the city council um, aren't voting on that anymore, the community is. So, you know, I would just encourage the community to, to educate yourself on, on that, um, uh, on that uh, vote, you know, the vote, what, what it's about and, and make a decision one way or another, how you feel about fireworks. But yeah, this is, uh, you know, this is not in the hands of the public safety department or the or the council anymore. It's now it's it's basically going on the ballot and will be in the hands of the community. Okay, here's a question from the Zoom chat. Why are so many cars, trucks, work vehicles, large fishing boats, large utility trailers allowed to park in large quantity on the streets, including Santa Dorothea Circle? Those parked on SDC often blocks the vision of cars when pulling out on the street. Yeah, I mean, give us, please give us a call. If there's vision obscurements, if there's vision issues, you know, we do need to address those. But, um, you know, people are allowed to park their vehicles on the street and they could park them there for up to 72 hours at a time. And we, we, we literally chase these vehicles around, right? And if we tag them and they move them, that game starts over again. So, um, yes, people... People can park their boats and, and trailers on the street. It's not a violation. It's only a violation if they leave them there for more than 72 hours. But we need you to call us because I don't know if the vehicle has been there for 72 hours. You as a neighbor do. And so that's how you help us. If you alert us to the fact, we can go out and tag it. But we, we can't just drive around tagging vehicles if we don't know it's an issue. So we encourage you to call us and let us know and, and we get out there. Like I said, I have three vehicle abatement, um, three CSOs who do vehicle abatement and they're taking your calls and they're getting the emails and they're going to check them out. So so please call us so we can we can check. But the vision issues are serious and we, we definitely want to know if a vehicle is, is blocking the vision for um, at an intersection, there are things we can do. Sometimes we get public works in, involved to, to paint uh, no parking area just to get people to back up. So but it is important to let us know so we can check those out. Awesome. Another firework question. With the fire risks we are all facing, why has Roner Park allowed the sale and use of any fireworks? Leading up to, through, and after the 4th of July weekend, we had fireworks going off. Many have been way larger than the safe and sane ones being sold around the 4th. In addition, these fireworks terrorize our animals, and we've been finding pieces of exploded fireworks around our yard since. We can only think about how it could only take one spark to set a fire off. Will Runner Park please ban the use of fireworks going forward? Uh, so again, um, I would encourage this person to maybe go back and look at some of the um, recent council meeting um, that we've had to discuss fireworks. Um, the, and, and, and you'd find out that the, the council did pass an ordinance to ban fireworks. There was then a petition by the community to put a hold on that ban. And, and so that's why now it's going to vote. So, you know, I would encourage that person to really go back and look at that process of, of, of what the council did to address fireworks. Um, as far as the, the continuation of fireworks or the, the loud ones, you know, those are the illegal fireworks. Those, those, are, those are the fireworks that we spend hours and hours and days of our life asking people not to use, right? And we, we, we encourage them to, to be safe and not not to 
you know, be using dangerous fireworks, it can start fires. And um, there's just a population in the community that believe they're entitled to, to just do whatever they want, right? They don't care about their neighbor, they don't care about the community. And so they go out and they buy these illegal fireworks that explode in the air and, you know, rain sparks down on the dry grass and people's uh, roofs. So, I mean, we really do what we can to let people know about the dangers. But like I said, it, it's, a, it's a population of individuals out there who, who don't want to follow those rules and who want to have their fun at the expense of the community. So until we as a, as a community make it socially unacceptable and, and you know, we're willing to, to point out our neighbor um, and say, I will, you know, I'll sign that citation because I'm tired of this. It's gonna be difficult to, to, to make it go away. Um, in regards to that question, there was another question that came up that goes well with it. Can you share which sections you responded to the most on 4th of July? Uh, every section. Um, you know, I, I was, I was, uh, I wrote, I wrote three sections, a couple in H section and one in D section, but we wrote citations all over. Um, and, you know, it's pretty incredible. I reported out at, at council, but there were several times that I, I parked my vehicle and attempted to walk into a neighborhood. I mean, like six, seven blocks down. Um, and I was observed by someone on a bike or someone standing on a corner and they immediately got on their phone and the fireworks immediately stopped. So, um, you know, people are pretty sophisticated out there in order to, to do these illegal fireworks. They actually have people looking out and watching out. So um, it, it's difficult, difficult, but we, we, wrote sex, we wrote citations in every section and every section has their violators. Um, maybe some more than others, but uh, I, did, I did spend a lot of time in H section and L section trying to, trying to track down uh, some of those violators. All right, we have a question from the Zoom chat for the guest, me. What are tail signs to watch for when it comes to suspicious human trafficking from a public's view? Um, well, we did a five hour class, so it, you know, there's a lot on it. Um, all I can say is, you know, when you see somebody who might be in like poor living conditions, signs of physical abuse, um, or maybe a broken household can definitely put our young children at risk for either trafficking or being groomed into a gang. It's really important to get out there and work with the youth. And this is something I told the, the officers, when you see an at-risk teenager, be that mentor before a trafficker is that mentor and get to know your, ch your children that are having some, some problems, get to know them, get to help them. Um, and you know you can always reach out to me for more information because there's a lot. It's way too much for this chat. <laughs> um, so, no, maybe if I add something on there, because you know I I actually uh, I actually went through the class myself. I didn't just did. have mm -hmm. the officers. I I sat through it also, and um, you know, a couple of the things I got I took away from that regarding this question was one, you know the 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 fruit vendors, right. We, we have this image in our mind of, a, of, a, of human trafficking and the image that prior to your training came to mind was, you know, um, sex trafficking, right? Or even afterwards, you talked about um, um, the work trafficking, but in a different way, I thought. But then when you started talking about like, it can be, it can be the, the, the person selling the fruit at the, at the stand, right? It can be, uh, it could be a labor labor stuff a lot of labor trafficking so you know I, I you know people want to know i would encourage them to reach out to you because that really opened my eyes to wow i was so narrow-minded on what human trafficking was um that i i would have never thought that you know that person out there selling cutting up the fruit and selling it could be a victim of human trafficking in a Absolutely. different right so anyway i, I it, it was interesting and, and and i just want to let you know that you know, those are those are some, some great things I walked away from. It, it really broadened my mind um, on that subject. Yes. Um, yeah, definitely people have in their mind a perception of what it is, you know, and it's so much more than that. And so, yeah, I'm glad that you guys had that takeaway. Um, from Facebook, gang violence is escalating. Does Runner Park Department of Public Safety have a task force? And as a citizen, what should I be on the lookout for? 
Yeah, we we have so we have a, a cops team, a community oriented policing team. It's a three member team. They're not assigned to patrol, um, and you know they that's the team that I have that addresses specific problems. It's 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 a kind of a problem oriented policing team, um, and so uh, yeah, they are they work with the the other agencies around us. You know, um, the gangs don't have um, they're territorial, but they're not they're spread out too, right? So they're Santa Rosa, Petaluma, Verona Park, they're all, they all can be members and, and work together. So um, we work with those agencies also, as well as the county. Uh, you know, things to look out for is just, you know, different behaviors, um, uh, tagging. If you see tagging in your area that could, that can lead to something, please let us know. Uh, because what you see is paint on a fence or paint on a building. Uh, we may see messages that indicate, you know, something could be happening or there's there's some kind of this you know feud going on so always let us know if you see tagging you know in your neighborhood or on, on your fences uh, so we can get over there and get that taken care of but um you know just it's just awareness uh, and and being aware of who's in your area new people in your area you know are we are we starting to see people collect at a certain house is it becoming a hangout um is there you know increased just increased theft or violence and just in the neighborhood you're seeing more you know fights in the street um those sorts of things but you know i don't, I don't i'm not gonna say rona park has a huge huge gang problem um we have had a couple incidences recently because that that's just where the trouble ended up but um but we are always aware of it we're working with our uh, partner agencies to make sure that we know you know anything that's going on you know with with any of the gangs around the area so we can determine whether we may have an issue here. All right. Uh, next question from the email. Are you worried about the safety of the mobile response units that will be responding to calls from mentally ill people or family disputes that start out nonviolent and then escalate? Yeah, this, you know, it's interesting that there's an article in the paper the other day and I, Alex was reading the comments um, and this came up. This came up, and then someone called me today, actually, actually kind of asking the same question. And you know, I think it's important. One is there's a there's a system to bringing this team in, and part of that system is is uh, in depth training. So in depth training of our of our dispatchers mainly because they're going to be um, triaging the calls. But you know, what questions are we asking to make sure that we are sending the right response to these calls? Um, you know, we're not going to be sending this team to calls where we think there's any kind of violence that has happened, is going to happen, or it's happening. That's not going to have to go right. And then a lot of these, a lot of calls will be, you know, there may be a, a dual response, police and, you know, the team goes. And then once they get there, the police say, oh, you know, you don't need us, we're good, we leave. Um, or it may be the police are, are dispatched because that's the information. But when we get there, we realize, this is more of a, a call for the response team. So have them come and we'll leave. So, you know, we're going to, and we'll ease into it, but there's a lot of training that goes on to bring the dispatch and this team together and how to, how to respond to calls. The other thing to think about is most of the calls that this team will be responding to, you know, are, are calls that actually when, when we are the ones that are dispatched and we arrive, just our presence, our arrival, can sometimes escalate these calls, right? Um, you get someone who is suffering from a, a mental uh, issue. They're, they're having some issues mentally. And then the person who arrives is a, is a uniformed police officer with a duty belt and a gun, right? And that, and that anxiety, we just send that anxiety through the roof. So, so really, this is all about triaging the call, training dispatch to triage, and then just making sure we get the right team. And erring on the erring on the side of safety, right? If we're just not sure, then we send public safety, and they can evaluate the call and get the right team there. But we're not going to be sending this team in anything to where you know we think it could escalate or is escalating. Question from Facebook: Can the names of those who receive citations for fireworks be published to help with the social pressure to stop the behavior? Good old public shaming. Oh yeah. Well, they've already been. Uh, they they they've already received the pressure. They received a thousand dollars worth of pressure on that particular night. Um, 
I think where the pressure, you know, where we need to continue pressure is, you know, like, and we talked about, it, I know how hard it is, but with the neighbor, you know, or someone in there, or the people in the, in the, in the cul-de-sac or on the street going over and say, Hey, stop that. Or I'm going to call the police. Right. Um, I will tell you though, one of the things that, that I did, I did notice, which I, I really feel like I was just, I don't know, I was speaking to nobody uh, through this whole thing was the tickets that I wrote, two of the three tickets that I wrote were actually at the end of, in, in cul-de-sacs, which I know that's hard to, hard to pin down in this city because they're all cul-de-sacs, but they were in cul-de-sacs and it wasn't a family out there. It was, it was the entire group out there. Yes, one person was lighting them off, but the entire cul-de-sac was enjoying these skyrockets and these illegal fireworks, right? So, so I guess as long as, as people are going to tolerate it and, and say it's okay and get the enjoyment out of it, we're going to have a really hard time putting the public pressure on them. Um, but, you know, hopefully I, the, the calls keep getting more and more every year. So I'm hoping that, you know, at some point people just say enough's enough and, and don't do that in our neighborhood or, or we'll have to, well, I'll have to report you. Um, but no, I can't put them, I, I can't put their names out there, but, but believe me, the people that got citations this year that they got pressured with, with the fine. Yeah, thousand dollars is a lot of money. At least it is for me. So it not is. worth it. Right. Um, all right. So this is again about the RVs, trailers. Is the squad car labeled vehicle abatement new? Confirming that it's to address the long-term cars, boats, and RVs on the street. I have followed the issue since the city council meeting now two years ago and would like to hear about the program and how it is working and how residents are adapting to it. Yeah, so that so it's it's not new. Um, uh, we've had, we've had the three CSOs, uh, who have been, you know, responsible for code enforcement from the curb out. So basically that's our vehicle abatement. Um, and we've been doing it for years now. Um, what, what you saw at the council meeting a couple of years ago was us trying to figure out maybe trying to rewrite or look at a new ordinance that would address, uh, parking of RVs or trailers and unattached trailers on the street. Um, and, and believe it or not, uh, we're still working on that. Um, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of law to go through to create a parking program. And, um, so we're trying to still figure out how to do it, being fair to the community, but addressing these travel trailers and trailers in the long street. Uh, so we haven't stopped that, but the vehicle abatement, those are the three CSOs that work for public safety. And yeah, their primary job is, is to address um, address the cars in the street. You know, I mean, we have, you know, a population of 43,000 people, you know, um, there's a lot of cars in the city. So you may not, you may not think that we're making a dent, but, but we actually address a lot of vehicles each, each day uh, with our CSOs through citations and towing um, and in actual abatements. But uh, sometimes it's a process. You got to tag the vehicle, wait 72 hours. If they move it, you got to tag the vehicle again, wait 72 hours. And if you're going to try to abate it, you actually have to tag the vehicle. You have to send a letter to the owner. You have to wait 10 days, right? So that gives, so sometimes processes get in the way of progress. <laughs> um, but we still go out there every day and, and, and try to get the vehicles off the streets that shouldn't be on the street. All right, question for Chief Matos. Will there be a national night out this year? I, I don't know. Um, I, you know, we had talked a little bit about it and then with this Delta variance and these new masking requirements, um, we're, we're, we're really not thinking it's, it's, it's gonna be safe for us to create an environment where we bring people together right now out, out here like we normally do because one of the things I'm hearing is they believe the uptick in positive cases is as a result of large gathering. Um, you know, I would encourage people though to 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 use that night um, to get to know your neighborhood. You know, National Night Out was really designed to have people come out of their homes into their streets and meet their neighbors. You know, break bread, get to know each other. That's what National Night really was designed for. Um, and so, you know, hopefully this is, this is the time where we can, we can actually maybe encourage people to stay in their neighborhoods 
meet the people on your street, plan a barbecue, uh, and get to know your neighbors. So you start looking out for each other that way. And, you know, and hopefully if we can get through this, this darn pandemic, um, we can bring that back. Um, I have been contacted by an individual who's been arrested in maybe uh, running our neighborhood watch program as a volunteer. So we are working through that um, to try to get that done. But hopefully, um, you know, with that and next year, we can bring National Night back out. But I would still, I'm still hopeful that if we do, it will be into the, it will be, we will come to you. We will come to your barbecues and your celebrations so that you stay in your neighborhoods, right? I always thought the funniest thing was to, to talk about National Night Out and, you know, taking back your street, but then inviting you down to the park. <laughs> like, no, take back your, let's take back our street on our street. Let's make a stand on our street and, you know, get to know our neighbors. So uh, we're going to try to do something new, but, but this year with, with COVID and this uptick, I, I just don't think it's a good idea to try to bring a bunch of people together out here. All right. From Facebook, how can you become a volunteer firefighter? No, we don't, we have, we do not have any volunteer firefighters here in the city. Um, but I will ask, I will talk to my deputy chief to see what we've done in the past. Um, is it because we just don't have any individuals who have wanted to be volunteer firefighters? Um, but I will, uh, I will get an answer uh, to that and I'll put it out on Facebook. Um, so keep looking out for that and I'll get you an answer. Um, you know, one of the things that's hard is that the, the volunteer firefighter, um, reserve police officer, you just don't see as many of them now anymore because of the requirements to, to get certified to be, to do that. And if you're going to go through that, most people just want to be a firefighter or be a police officer. Um, and so we actually have seen, you know, it, a lot of the fire districts, you know, there's a lot of volunteer firefighters, but, you know, cities, cities, it's, it's hard to get volunteers because most people, if they're going to go through all that trouble to get certified, um, you know, five month academy, they, they just want to do the job. So, uh, but I'll check into it. I'll see what we've done in the past, whether we even have a program here. It's nice. This is the first time it's come up to me. All right. What are your stats on citations for speeding and reckless driving through the neighborhoods? It seems like it's increasing. I, I, and that's one of the things I've always said on, on this chat is I will get any information I can for people. Um, but so, something like that, I'll take, I'll have to get that information. Um, I do, I do not have that at my fingertips. Um, but again, the, I always get the chat record here. And so anything that, you know, we try to follow up on, I, I'll, I'll get out on social media and we'll get some answers. So, um, but I'll look into it. Um, I know that our, 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 um, our citations are up uh, since we've come out of out, coming out of the pandemic. We've we've been more proactive. You know, there was a there was a time when the pandemic first hit, we we had to pull back because you know we weren't being as proactive. We were handling calls, but we were trying not to make a lot of contact with people. You know, and so but we've been picking that up. Plus the um, you know the request of the officers to do the 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 traffic every day. We have seen an increase in our in our citations, uh, but I'll get the numbers. From Facebook, when will ride-alongs resume? Oh, I was I was so excited. We were gonna, we we actually talked about it recently. Of, of hey, you know, I think we can start doing that. We're gonna have to figure out how to how to you know make sure individuals are vaccinated, right? Because they're gonna get in the cars and stuff. But how do we do all that stuff? We held off now because of this new masking recommendations and. Um, and, and you know the uptick so um hopefully uh as, as soon as as soon as we clear this hurdle with this pandemic we will start doing right yeah i saw something that petaluma police did they had like uh, one of their civilian employees get in the car with the went facebook live and they did like a virtual ride along you know where people could ask questions and things like that it was kind of neat all right um email Amazing. I hope I'm allowed to ask a question of Megan. My question is, what do you consider is the key to recovery and obtaining success after dealing with an incredibly difficult life experience? Thank you. Um, 
So one of the things that I talked about when I came to work with your department, um, one of the things I call is getting a hand up and not a handout. Um, and there's no way that I could have done it by myself, right? It took resources, uh, resources like Verity. I was going to food banks. I was basically, you know, utilizing any resource that I could to help me out, you know, finding a job that would help reimburse my tuition for school. So I put myself through EMT. It, it took community, but it took me also wanting to do it. You have to want to better yourself as well. And those two things combined, it, you know, it's been six years. So it's baby steps, you know, and um, I just take a personal inventory and realize that what I've gone through is not my fault. And I create a purpose, which again, training your department for 10 hours was fulfilling that purpose of trying to prevent it from happening to anybody else, which I know it will, but we can try to to prevent what we can, you know, instead of just shutting it away and forgetting about it, I'm trying to uh, trying to find fulfillment and purpose. So yeah, basic community work, it takes a village and we have some great resources here in Sonoma County. Absolutely, I, 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 uh, I think I, I told you the day when you came in and were, were uh, providing the training. I mean, I know it was hard getting up there and, and, and discussing that, especially when, you know, you're discussing your, your, your personal story, right? Not just, hey, these are things to look out for. And, but when you're talking about you and, and how you got trapped into this and, and stuff, um, I, remember, I remember telling you, you're going to wear out my carpet um, because it's, 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 it's a difficult thing. And, you know, you, you would pick up your pace and you never stopped walking. And I know that, uh, that's how you, you were dealing with it that day. But, but, you know, I looked at that and I thought, I thought about how strong you were to come through that and then want to want to tell your story and pass it on, not for sympathy, but because you truly don't want it to happen to someone else. And you feel that, you know, if you can get the word out there, you might save somebody from falling into that trap. And, uh, you know, I think that's, that's, that's what we're all hoping for, right? We just, we know we can't save the world, but if maybe we can save a few, right, it's great. So, uh, but I, I, I'll, I'll never forget the training, watching you, uh, watching you walk back and forth. They come and have to replace that carpet right there. <laughs> you know, we're out my carpet. Yeah, I drink, and I drank a lot of water too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't see any questions right now. Is um, I guess we can wait for some to come in, but at the you know, moment, while while we're waiting for some to come in, um, uh, yeah, I can I can fill some of that time real quick. So one of the things we are um, we are looking at doing for as we move forward in these chats is I I really do want to start trying to bring people together, right? We've been, I mean, these Zooms and Facebook Live have been great. Um, but what I would like to do is, is, is start, start doing them at a location where if you want, you can come in person. If you don't, you can still stay home, do the Zoom, do the Facebook Live, right? Because we don't want to lose that. Um, and, and I don't want people to feel like, oh, the only way I can, I can participate is if I go there. So I want to keep the Zoom and the Facebook Live, but it, my intention is to open this up and um, and and start doing it in locations where the host and I are actually there. You can come in, so you can ask questions live there too, uh, and then the host will kind of moderate what's coming in through Facebook Live and Zoom, but also allow people to actually kind of ask ask questions who want to show up there. So uh, I guess it'd be more of a hybrid I'm looking at doing. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see where that goes. I was hoping to do it August 3rd. We got to see where this masking recommendation goes and, you know, if people if, see if we can get people to get out there and get vaccinated um, so we can get rid of these masks. Um, I, I have mine. I've been wearing it all day. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, so I hope I hope uh, I hope we can encourage people who who want to come to the live when we get an opportunity to, to come live and um, ask our questions. All right, just got a question. I believe that most of us think human trafficking is a big city problem. Does Runner Park have a system in place to protect victims who get caught up in it? So 
the cops team that I, I talked about earlier when the question was asked about the, the, the gang um, issue. So one of the, I will tell you that one of the, one of the things they spend a lot of time on is human trafficking. Um, and they work with a lot of the agencies you talked about, Verity, um, uh, some of the, the domestic violence groups. They, they work with a lot of groups to try to help get, help identify victims of human traffic and then get them into the services get them away from that and into the services. Um, it has been a focus of theirs. They've done some great work back there. Um, they've actually had some uh, good prosecutions of, of individuals who were uh, running human traffic, right? And so, but, but the, I think the thing that makes me most proud of how that team works is they're, they're law enforcement officers, right? So you think their whole goal is we gotta put the bad guy away, you know, or the bad girl away, right? But they really understood, and, and detective division, is that while we're working the, to, to address the, the suspect, we got to make sure that we're putting the victims in the best, best position to come out of this, right? Because if you just separate the suspect and the victim, well, that suspect's going to get back out at some point, right? Or the victim isn't going to have the tools or the ability to, to take that step up that you're talking about to get themselves out of it. And they're just going to get pulled right back in, right? And uh, you know, I know that when the cops teams working um, with these cases, they're they're looking at the victim and how to get them out of it as much as they are trying to get that suspect taken care of. So, so yes, we do have some processes, we, and we do have a team that addresses it. Um, and I think they do. A, I think they do a phenomenal job. Yeah, we talked about that a lot. The trauma informed response. And until your victim is safe and their their whatever they've got going on has been treated, they can't help you prosecute. And if you leave them out there, they'll just pick, get picked up by another trafficker. Mm -hmm. And uh, other things that the public can look for in terms of trafficking, we mentioned that a little bit earlier in the conversation. There are some some red flags, um, and you know, basically, you have your at risk children. Um, you know, you have parents who are working multiple jobs and they might be low income. So they're trying to kind of keep up with their peers. That, that's a huge risk for teenagers. Um, for adults, when we talk about labor, we talk about unregulated industries and we talk about um, places that, you know, want you to pay only cash or, you know, workers that are getting underpaid. They might still be getting paid, but they're getting paid not enough. Um, and again, you can always reach out to me. Um, I, I do have Facebook too, and I can get you in touch with um, some educational resources for the public as well. Because like I said, five hours is not going to cover right here in the, in the next 15 minutes we have. Yeah, you know what, I, I actually, I, I'm, not, I'm glad that people are writing in and asking these questions of, of you also, because uh, this is a societal problem. This, this is a, it, and it's, a, it's an issue that affects our community. Because we have it, it happens here. You know, it's not a big city um, problem. It's it's an every city problem, and so I think it is important for the public to to maybe understand some of those some of those signs and some and you know when you look at something and you're like hmm, that doesn't look right. It's probably not right, right? Um, and you know when you know you 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 shouldn't see someone pull up to a hotel room and and a, and, a, and a female young female get out and go into a room. Right, and then the person stay parked in the car in the, in the hotel, right? I mean, you, and if you, those are signs that you, you see that step, you know, call. We we can check it out. We want to make sure the victims are safe. But but yeah, I I always say that if you look at something and you're kind of like, hmm, there's something wrong there. Probably is, right? And so, but uh, but I I do I I any way we can we can educate the public on, on helping it to, you know. To identify this, I'm I'm 100% for. So I don't mind using time on the chat to talk about, you know, some of the stuff that we can look for. Yeah, and it's not a big city problem. You know, I was trafficked in a county with only 50,000 residents, very uh, small rural place. So it can happen anywhere, and we mean anywhere. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, one of the other things I I would encourage people to do, and I I, I know I'm. Uh, I'm surprised the question hasn't come up, but you know we saw an uptick again recently in catalytic converter thefts. Um, 
And so I, I know there are a lot of stories. They were, I mean, the news is starting to pick it up. You're starting to see it on Channel 2, Channel 4 News. So it's, it's getting more, you know, more awareness out there. You know, but I still encourage people to, you know, to, to be aware of their, where they're parking, try to get additional lighting, cameras. If you can put some kind of protective cage, you know. I mean, I had someone tell me that they didn't want to do it. They didn't want to spend the money. You know, it was like $150. And, and then after they got their catalytic converter stolen and it cost them you know, about 1000 to get it replaced, they said that would have been a pretty good investment, right? And I didn't blame them because I, you know, I, I understand, right? But um, so I just, I encourage people, if you can somehow provide extra safety to that catalytic converter, which are still like gold right now, uh, I would please do it uh, or, or get your car parked in the garage. Take the stuff out of your garage, stack it on the driveway, park your car in the garage. You know that that'll save you. Um, but you know, extra lighting and awareness because there. I don't know if the people that you know there were a lot of arrests made and a lot of cases made and and it went down. And you just we just saw this big decline, right? And now I don't know if those they're out or they, you know, they'll they'll be future bell jumpers for. Uh, for you, I don't know, but but we're seeing an uprise, and and we don't want people to be victimized um, with these catalytic converters. Well, you know, with the zero dollar bail right now, those people aren't having to post bail. <laughs> True. Just get a citation to come back next month, and then you know, steal another one to pay for the citation. So, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, the catalytic converter thing has been around a while. Um, I remember ten years ago, I I had this older car out of the 70s right and I was rebuilding it and uh, I went down I was buying all these secondhand parts to try to save a little bit of money um, and I remember saying I need to have a catalytic converter so that this thing can pass smog and they said we actually don't resell those because then it encourages people to steal them we're not allowed to sell them because of the precious metals inside so I knew this like several years ago and then there the um, junkyards were not allowed to buy and resell them, but obviously somebody is buying them. We just don't know who, but that perpetuates the crime. When you have a demand, there will be a supply. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. So I have any, have any more questions come in today? Um, not yet. All right. Well, I, I think I'm, I must be boring people or you know what it is. I'll tell you what it is. It's summertime. Everybody's on vacation, right? That's what it is. Um, but I do, I you know, I do want to uh, thank everybody who did did join in. Uh, this is our this is our first and only one for July because I I did I took a vacation. I know I messed up our whole schedule. Um, so hopefully, uh, if I upset people by taking a vacation, I'll, we'll get them back because uh, we'll can we'll continue to do these and we'll be back on August third, I believe is our next one. And we will see how it goes. Um, I will, uh, if, if it's possible, we'll have that one in person. I, I promise you. Um, and if we don't, it's only because out of just caution. But I'm hoping to have that one in person. And we'll get a lot of information out ahead of time so, so you know where it is and, and how to attend. Um, but, you know, those of you who joined tonight, uh, thank you so much. Oh, someone apparently has a question. Um, I stepped away for a minute, but my other question is, will there be any CERT training? CERT CCRT. training. Yes. Uh, there, so that is when we talked about this, that on, on, on this before, I would love to get a CERT team going in the community. Um, they're such a valuable asset when we're looking for uh, missing persons or lost children. Um, they, they, they've helped in so many, in so many ways and other agencies that I've, I've been involved with. So uh, yes, uh, we, we definitely want to get a CERT team going. There will be CERT training uh, just as soon as we can actually gather again uh, as, as groups and, and, you know, fill rooms um, safely to do that training. Uh, I was, I tell you, I was so excited because we were, it looked like we were just starting to come out of this, right? Um, you know, and then we uh, that Delta variants hit, numbers go up, recommended start recommendations start flying around, and and we kind of taken a step back. So uh, as soon as we can do that, we're going to get right along back. Uh, you know, we we really would like to bring back our Citizens Academy. There's some stuff we want to do to get some um, youth programs going. Uh, sir, they're all they're all waiting. 
on the board to, to start you know moving into action. Uh, it's just a matter of how we do it safely and you know how we how we uh, how we do it without having to break it up and make it choppy because we got to keep stopping and starting. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And all these things you guys are doing is helping bring together this divide that has been created between a lot of the public and law enforcement. And it's it's very us versus them. And I think what you guys are doing is great to help build trust and get to know your community and allow them to get to know you. So it's not such a big mystery, you know. Thank you. And you said it, that, that's, that's exactly right. We just, you know, I think one, we get so busy focusing on, on our job and doing our job that we forget, we, we get blinders on and we forget like who we're serving. We know we're serving, but we, we right? And so we start working within our own little bubble. And um, so this is the funnest part of the job for me is actually getting out, meeting people in the community and, and trying to connect with the community. And, you know, I've really seen a lot of our officers uh, lately who, have, who are really, um, stepping out and, and wanting to do more things in the community, um, which is exciting. But yeah, if the community doesn't know us, we can't expect them to like us, right? You got to get to know us and you'll find out we are just human. We're just your brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers. That's what we are. But if we don't let you know that, how can we expect, how can you, we expect you to get to know us if we don't, if we don't open those doors? So, you know, uh, things like this, you know, I think are great. Uh, I'm, I'm more into the person. The person I love being out in the community, um, which I'm starting to get to do a little bit more. Uh, and, and like I said, I'm really seeing a lot of it from the officers. Um, you know, I had an officer come up to me the other day and said, I, I, would, I would love to, to be able, there's a coaching opportunity at one of the schools and I would love to be able to do that here in Rotary Park, right? And I'm like, absolutely. What, what better what better way to to show a group of kids that you know I I may wear a uniform during the day but I'm 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 just I'm your coach now right and and so those are the things I'm really encouraging I'm seeing people take it up and I'm I'm, I'm excited about about where we're going and and how we're going to reconnect with the community it's not the community's fault right it's our fault we we got we got busy and and we lost that connection. I think that the, the community very supports us uh, incredibly. Uh, they respect us. Um, I think, I, I know the community believes we do a really good job, um, but I don't know that they know us. And so that, that's where I wanna work. I wanna let them, let them get to know us. So we'll continue to do that. All right, one last message says, stay safe, Chief. Thank you work, for working so hard to keep us safe. Thank you very much. And again, thank you everybody for who, who gave up the time tonight uh, to jump on this. And Megan, I know you're busy. We did a 10 o'clock practice today and I think you just got off work and you probably slept most of the day so you can get ready to go to work tonight. And so, you know, your dedication shows also and uh, uh, we're always here if you need anything. Let's keep working together. And thank you so much for, uh, for, for doing this tonight for us. Absolutely, anytime. All right. And if anybody else would like to host, just let me know. Um, yeah, anybody can host this show. Yep. So you, you, because your job is to make me look smarter, right? That's <laughs> I know that's a tough job. Uh, yeah. So, so just let me know if you're interested. Uh, love, I'd love to find any anybody who wants to host the show. Love to bring them on. So, all right. Well, with that, I think we will we will end in record time tonight. I think. Um, Give everybody a, an early dinner. <laughs> we'll see everybody later. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. you.